Welcome to Westminster Seminary, California. This is our third day of our Den Dalk series. As many of you have joined us the last two days, we've been blessed to have our speaker here with us, challenging us, stretching us, and teaching us about the rigors and joys of pastoral ministry. Robert G. Dendolk and Nellie Dendolks set up this uh, lecture series since 1993 to bring on campus experienced pastors and wise mentors to teach us just such things in terms of pastoral ministry as many of us are preparing to go into the field and the local churches. So we're delighted to fin finish well here with our third lecture, but as we do so, let's all rise and sing all the verses of the uh, Psalter Hymnal, uh, the Red Psalter Hymnal 355, We Are God's People. Trinity Hymnal 355. Please be seated. One of the things that people do not usually recognize about California, and Southern California in particular, is though that we don't have big steeple churches, we have a lot of vibrant and healthy reformed churches, not only in our region, but in our local county, San Diego County as well. 
We're delighted to have many graduates as, as well as pastors serving alongside. And we're so grateful that they're often visiting with us to teach. One thing I forgot as we invited Pastor Ted, who will be speaking for us one last time, is the fact that he's serving at a local church, New Life PCA, where he's been pastoring for 20 years. When you invite a speaker from afar, it's a break for them to concentrate on the lectures before them. When you invite someone local, it's extra work beyond what they regularly do on a weekday basis. But we're so grateful for Ted being here, giving us wisdom, and sharing with us his experience from the last 20 years that many of us have benefited from already. And we're so thankful to Linda for allowing him to have space and time for him to prepare this way and supporting him in prayer throughout this process as well as the years of service. Today is the last lecture that he'll be sharing with us titled Congregational Life and Humility uh, along the larger theme of is the local church too small a thing for you with the subtitle the impact and challenges of dedicated service to one congregation something that Ted knows a lot about. Let's welcome him this morning as he delivers his final lecture. Thank you, Joel, for that recognition that I am working uh, this week. Um, no, it's uh, good to be with you again. Thank you uh, for, for being here. Thank you to those of you who are watching online as well. Um, so far, we've, we've, we've thought about um, dedicated ministry, uh, as we've thought about dedicated ministry to one local congregation. We've We've covered the topic of the pursuit of excellence and how that intersects with humility. We've looked yesterday at the issue of leadership, how you lead, uh, and, that inter and how that intersects with humility. Um, and I've tried to make the case on both those days that the, the primary sin to avoid uh, is pride and, and, and one of the primary virtues we should uh, pursue is humility. Now today, as we wrap up, uh, we're going to look at what I'm calling congregational life. And what I mean by that is mostly what you do as a pastor when you're not preaching or, or moderating a, an elder meeting. Yeah, it's really just living with your people. Uh, if you've ever actually seen a, a, a shepherd of real sheep, uh, and you may run across them in California, actually, uh, in, the, uh, in parts of the eastern Sierra where I like to hang out. Uh, one of the things you'll always see if you encounter uh, a, a shepherd uh, and his sheep is somewhere in the vicinity is going to be some sort of portable dwelling, whether that's uh, a camper trailer or some kind of, of temporary shelter, that's because shepherds still today actually live with their animals. Um, and as under shepherds of God's people, so do we. Uh, it's, it's what differentiates pastoring from, um, from what our professors do uh, or being on the parachurch uh, speaking circuit. Uh, and congregational life is no different from uh, from pursuing excellence or from leading, uh, the, the way you do it successfully over the long haul, the way you live with your congregation successfully over the long haul, is uh, by forsaking pride and embracing the humility uh, of Jesus. Uh, what should that look like? Uh, what should the, this uh, counter-cultural congregational life look like? Well, I, Paul's description in Colossians 3 is probably as good as any. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. Paul writes, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Well, that passage really read today sort of stands as a rebuke, doesn't it? 
uh, to the church over the last couple of years. Uh, we have uh, failed, I think, in a big way uh, as, as the church to, to live, as Paul describes here, uh, as we faced the presidential election and then the pandemic. Huge swaths of the Church of Jesus Christ have behaved worse than pagans, uh, have treated fellow Christians uh, unbiblically in a way that does not reflect well on Jesus. And as a result, uh, the church has lost some credibility, it's compromised its witness, it's put a huge amount of stress on pastors. And it's a shame, really, because how we live together, you know, at our best, is an incredible witness to the gospel. Uh, it is, you know, it is an offering to the world of the alternative, right, to the, to the dog-eat-dog -dog world that we all live in. Uh, to, to, to see Christian community in action. Uh, unfortunately, they haven't seen us at our best uh, in the last couple of years. So this morning, what I want to do is lay out a couple of things. First, uh, general guidelines uh, for uh, living with your people in a way that I would hope would build the kind of community we just read about here in Colossians 3. And then second, after those general principles, I want to give you a couple of guardrails to, that will help keep you on task as a pastor. All of this today I would put under the um, rubric of common sense. Uh, some of it will sound uh, obvious to you. Uh, unfortunately, uh, what I've found the longer I've lived and worked both as a lawyer and now as a minister is that common sense is distressingly uncommon. Um, and, and so it always helps to go back and, and review the basics. Um, so the general guidelines, I've got seven, you know, nice biblical number, but which means I better move fast. Uh, so, I, so I will. Uh, the first principle, conferring dignity. Conferring dignity. Uh, in a letter to his son, who is also a pastor, uh, Eugene Peterson, who I've already quoted a couple of times in these lectures, Eugene Peterson wrote the following. I wonder if one of the greatest things that a pastor can do after the basics are in place the preaching and praying and teaching, staying true to God and following Jesus, is to treat men and women with simple dignity. I think Peterson's on to something. Certainly outside the church, that doesn't happen very often. And as, we've, uh, as I've already remarked too often, uh, it doesn't happen inside the church. Uh, men and women are, are, are not given the simple dignity that comes from them being human beings made uh, in the image uh, of God. Instead, we, we are tempted to treat them uh, sort of like the culture treats them, right? Right? where we, we sort of classify them according to their productivity or their education, their wealth, their status, their appearance, or the lack of those things. In his book titled Letters to My Children, uh, author Daniel Taylor, a Christian, uh, recalls a middle school experience that he had. He was the good, one of the good-looking, popular, cool kids. Uh, he's about my age, so he's reflecting on a school experience that was similar to mine. And, and you can't believe they, we did those things back then. But... Once a week, this is middle school, once a week the students had dance instruction. Uh, I, I, I hated that day. Uh, the, the, boy, the boys would line up single file outside at, by, the front, by the door to the classroom. The girls would sit at their desks in the classroom and the boys would one at a time walk in and choose their partner. Now, now, imagine, I mean, just think about, what were they thinking about the persons, the people that always get chosen last, right? And uh, in this particular classroom, that was Mary. Mary was always chosen last. She had had polio uh, as a child, so she had a limp. 
She had a withered arm, and she was, because of the limp and the arm, couldn't exercise as much, and so was somewhat overweight. She was nice, but of course her middle school peers didn't value nice. Uh, as I said, Daniel was a Christian, so was the aide in the classroom. And one Sunday, the aide caught Daniel at church and said, hey, next time we have dance, you need to ask, you need to choose Mary. And uh, I will quote Daniel. He, he, he says here, she may as well have told me to fly to Mars. It was an idea that was so new and inconceivable that I could barely hold it in my head. You mean pick someone other than the best, the most pretty, the most popular when my turn came? That seemed like breaking a law of nature or something. And yet Daniel knew that that's exactly what the, that what the aide was asking was exactly what Jesus would do and what Jesus expected of him. But he said, quoting again, I agonized because choosing Mary would go against all the coolness I had accumulated. The next time uh, dance class rolled around as uh, the Lord would have it, his teacher placed Daniel at the front of the line. Uh, so there he dutifully walked in and every girl in the classroom was sitting at her desk. All of them turned looking to him, smiling, all except Mary, of course, who didn't even, didn't turn around, didn't raise her head. Uh, and because she knew what was coming, she was going to be chosen last, right? Like she always was. Um, and then I'll let, uh, I'll let Daniel finish the story. He said, I remember feeling very far away. I heard my voice say, I choose Mary. Never has reluctant virtue ever been so rewarded. I still see her face undimmed in my memory. She lifted her head and on her face, reddened with pleasure and surprise and embarrassment all at the same time, was the most genuine look of delight and even pride that I have ever seen before or since. It was so pure that I had to look away because I, didn't, I, knew, I knew I didn't deserve it. Mary came and took my arm, and she walked beside me, bad leg and all, just like a princess. It's a great story. It's a story of conferring dignity on someone. Well, that's a middle school classroom a long time ago. What's that look like in the church today? You can probably think of ways we can do this. Let me just give you one small example from my own regular experience at New Life. Almost every Sunday, one of the first people to come up to me uh, after our second service is is a man who uh, lives on the margins of society. Yeah, he possesses none of the cultural markers of success or importance. Uh, he is a kind of a rough around the edges uh, kind of guy. But when he comes up to me every Sunday, he has tears in his eyes, and it's not because of the sermon. <laughs> it's, it's because, and he's told me this a number of times, that he loves coming to New Life because he is welcomed by name, uh, the pastors listen to him, and take him seriously. Right? That's just simple human dignity. Uh, it's not rocket science. We, we just don't avoid him. Right? We don't avert our eyes. We don't give him the silent treatment. That's what the world does to him all week. Now, he may not be much in the world, but he is a prince in God's kingdom. And he, and he is entitled to, to, to that dignity. So confer dignity. It's a, it's a wonderful part of congregational life. Second, being personal. I, I know uh, we, we've talked about the personal nature of the, pa the pastoral uh, work, and, and it's important, right? personal, to be like the Trinity. Uh, now, New Life isn't a large church, but we aren't small either. Uh, and as it has grown gradually uh, over the years that I've been there, it's become an increasing challenge to, to maintain 
the personal, to, you know, to maintain that, the personal relationship between pastor and people. Um, one of the things that I have done that has seemed to, to work well, and I pass it on to you for what it's worth, um, uh, is, is I've become a letter writer. And, and by that I mean handwritten letters. Uh, I write uh, all the people who visit if, if they give me their contact information. And I write our members uh, as the Lord lays them on my heart. Uh, I might have discovered something about them lurking on social media uh, or, uh, uh, you know, uh, they've shared a prayer request with me or something. And I'll, and I'll just, I'll, I'll throw out, you know, I'll, I'll dash off a note. Um, one of the things I, we've uh, intelligently done was make, we have little, little note cards done, so I don't have to write a lot, right? It, it, and it's not, it's not the volume of, of what you write, it's, it's just the writing. And um, uh, I'll, I'll tell you a story, it just happened a few weeks ago. One of our members uh, was a custodian for 30 years, a local school district. Uh, he and his wife just moved out of state uh, for retirement. And I was talking, spoke to him on, a, on the last Sunday, uh, and he told me that one of the things he packed was a, to take to Tennessee was a letter I had written to him years ago. And I, and I said, seriously? He says, it's been on my refrigerator since I got it. I mean, for years. He says, I have never received a letter from a pastor. He says, I don't, I'm not sure I've ever received a handwritten letter. Um, again, that's, you know, I'm not, that, that's not rocket science. It's just personal. Uh, and there are, you know, you can do that. You can do a million other things. A lot of things you can do to, to just to maintain the personal. Um, you know, think about dialing back technology a little bit, right? Less emails, more phone calls. Um, more meetings, less texts, Right? Just a breakfast meeting or a lunch meeting with no other agenda than to uh, uh, get to know your people and how to pray for them. Visit the, your life groups or community groups, uh, d different ones in, in your church. Of course, obviously, visiting uh, in, in homes and uh, hospitals, nursing homes. Um, w one of the things I did uh, that may, might... Uh, for what it's worth, is I bought a pickup truck. Uh, you know, people need pickup trucks all the time, right? They're moving, uh, they're doing some projects, so it, it's an opportunity for me to get involved uh, either with my own pickup truck or very often I'll just throw them the keys and, and, and let them use it, right? It's just, it's, it's just pastoring is personal work and, and it's, you know, be creative. Uh, but, but do what you can to maintain that personal uh, relationship. Third, opening up. Um, I know there's a fine line between proper humility and improper catharsis. Right? The last thing you want to do is cathart all over your people. Um, <laughs> however, there, there's a balance there. I know there are, I, I know some pastors uh, are reluctant to openly admit their own struggles. Uh, perhaps because of tr training, the good training we get here, uh, w which convinces us of the uh, importance and the sort of the exalted nature of the pastoral office. Um, and the need to be an example for our people. I totally get that, and, and I'm on board with that. But I think you can still protect the dignity of the office and be an example and still be honest about yourself. What I have lost in terms of my own pride by being transparent with my struggles, I have gained back in a hearing for the gospel. People have been put off for too long by perfect pastors, right? 
uh, that uh, create an environment where, 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 where some people virtually despair of ever being a real Christian, like my pastor. Right? People have expressed appreciation over the years about my openness uh, with my own faults and struggles. Uh, and, you know, it's, it takes some wisdom to do that, and you, you might trip up, but I, I do think the, the, the gain is worth it. Um, but it enables them to hear me when I speak to them, right? Because now I'm speaking to them as, you know, struggler to struggler, right? Uh, and, and so they'll hear me, really hear me, as I, as I am pointing them, and I'm pointing myself to the perfection of Jesus uh, who welcomes messed up sinners like them and like me. Right? So the point here isn't to have our people admire us, it's to have them worship Jesus. So as you live with your people, right, whether that's in a, you know, open up with them. There, there's, be transparent, whether that's at a, you know, a lunch meeting or even whether it's in a sermon, be transparent. Fourth, leaving no one behind. Years ago, my eight-year-old son was in a city basketball league. Jim is 6'7 now. He's a big boy. Uh, but, and so even as an eight-year-old youngster, he was tall. So they were excited to have him on the team until they discovered who he really was. Um, during one game, uh, Jim got a rebound. Not surprisingly, he was the tallest kid on the court. Uh, and he headed up the court, and as he was heading up the court, a kid on the other team tried to steal the ball from him, and Jim unintentionally knocked the kid down with an elbow. Um, no harm, no foul. And, and, and Jimmy's there, and he's looking around, and of course, now everybody's screaming at him. The coach is screaming at him go to the basket, you know, either shoot or pass, right? And I'm yelling at him, you know, the worst of Little League dads. Um, and um, we're all yelling at him. And what does Jim do? He's, you know, he's looking at me. I'm yelling at him. He's looking at his coach. And he, he takes the ball and he puts it down on the floor. Slowly gets up and reaches down to this kid on the ground, reaches his hand down and pulls this kid up and says, are you all right? <laughs> the coach is pulling his hair out. <laughs> right. I, that shut me up. And, and, and that is poor basketball form. But yeah, I could not have been more proud of my son uh, in, in that moment. He wasn't going to leave this kid behind, even if he was on the other team. Uh, there's a lesson there, right? In our achievement-driven, success-craving, image-conscious culture, it is so easy, even in the church, to charge ahead and in doing so, leave people behind. And exhibit A of that is the now infamous quote of uh, Pastor Mark Driscoll, uh, and you, you probably heard this quote, um, he said, there is a pile of dead bodies behind the Mars Hill bus, and by God's grace, it'll be a mountain by the time we're done. Yeah, boy, it's silent in this room. You're all thinking, I can't believe a pastor would say that. There's a pile of dead bodies behind the Mars Hill bus, and by God's grace, it'll be a mountain by the time we're done. See, in the interest of control, Right and numeric success and fame, Driscoll was willing to, and in fact, did leave a lot of people behind. Guys, that really is the easy way, it, it, and, but it's not Jesus' way. Right? People do slow you down. Uh, they will have crushing, overwhelming needs. They will be hopelessly weak. Uh, they will lean the weight of their problems on you. Uh, they will listen to you but not follow your advice. They will have strong opinions different from yours. They will put you 
in positions where you don't have the resources anymore to deal with them. And, and in many churches, when confronted by these kinds of people, right, they'll be dropped. Now, they won't be dropped as, as, like Driscoll dropped them, but they'll be dropped. They might be politely told, you know, we can't help you anymore. Or they will just be avoided. But one way or another, those people will be dropped. And one of the ways you'll see, you know, when you become a pastor, uh, you know, there's always transfers going, going on. And, and, and often those people that have been left behind will, might end up at your church because they've, been, they, because they've been left behind by another church. Not as cruelly, not as directly as, as Driscoll did, but nevertheless uh, left behind. So, so be the church. When you're, when you're the pastor, be the church that goes the extra mile that listens to these people, that comes alongside them and tries to take care of them, that plays the long game with them, right? A lot of these crushing, overwhelming needs resist easy solution or quick solution. Um, it's hard, it's messy, it's going to take a disproportionate amount of your time, and many times all your effort will not pay off. But I, in the end, I think it's Jesus' way. I think it's Jesus' way. Don't, don't, don't leave anyone behind. Fifth, living out grace and truth. Right? We're good at preaching grace and truth, and we absolutely need to preach uh, the grace and truth of the gospel. But one of the best ways to um, form congregational life, to create that congregational community that Paul describes in Colossians 3 is to is to live out the grace and truth within within the congregation and and look for look for opportunities to do that um, they'll they'll come in unexpected ways and what you'll find I think at least what I have found is that um, distressingly you, you know, People don't remember my sermons a lot. But they will remember when, with it, when, it, when in the congregation we lived out what I'm, what I'm preaching about, when we live out grace and truth. Twice during my 20 plus year tenure now at New Life, we've had uh, young women uh, become pregnant out of wedlock who were part of the church. And in both cases, uh, separated by a, a number of years, they, the, the, the woman came forward to me and, and to the elders and confessed and repented uh, of, of their sin. Uh, and so in that case, right, no, church discipline is not called for uh, because you know, the goal of church discipline is, the, is for the disciplined person to to, to, to acknowledge their sin and to repent from it. Well, I've already got that. They've, they've come forward they've, as their own accusers, right? They've confessed it. They've repented from it. Uh, so so it was, church discipline was not uh, called for in these cases. But given the nature of the sin, right, it, it, the, the sin, even though it had been con re confessed, repented of, uh, w would become public. Right and obvious uh, as the weeks went by. So with the permission of uh, the young women involved in both these cases, uh, I, 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 uh, I got up as, as the senior pastor on a Sunday morning and explained the situation. Uh, and uh, that there had been sin, that this young woman had, had confessed and repented from it, had come to her elders and done that, and said, this is why we're not going to be engaging in church discipline, because, and I know some of you are going to gossip that we're not, as leaders, we're not taking action against this obvious sin. Look, we've, we've dealt with it. Church discipline is not called for here. And now what I need you to do, people, is not gossip, right? Not talk behind th this young woman's back. Um, 
what, what we need to do now is come alongside this, this, this young woman who's get, about to become a mom, and we need to welcome her and her baby into the community of our church. And, um, you know, so there it is. I mean, it was just a simple expression of truth, right? We, we identified sin, we called it sin. Uh, and then there's a simple expression of grace, right? We've, uh, the Lord has forgiven her, so we forgive her, and we treat her like the forgiven sinner she is, which is what we are too, right? We're just forgiven sinners. And I still get reports. It's been, I don't know, it's been at least five years since the last one, more than that probably. Yeah, right? Ten years? Wow. Uh, time flies. Uh, I still get reports of how people were, uh, were moved and impacted by the grace and the truth of the gospel on, on those two Sundays. They don't remember a thing I said, but they remember that, you know, that application of truth and grace. There's one other s occasion. Um, the former senior pastor, the senior pastor who preceded me at New Life, um, ha had had a morals fall. And he had, uh, had been released from his call and defrocked uh, because he was unrepentant um, and uh, you know left left the, the uh, left on those terms and uh, was uh, dismissed from the presbytery and whatnot. Um, then that was then followed by an interim period when they were searching for the new pastor. Dennis Johnson was uh, the interim pastor, but. Um, Anyway, I, I, for years, when I first came and took the call, I, I began to develop hard feelings about this former pastor because I would be, uh, you know, I was trying to, um, I realized I was in a, a, ch a church that had been seriously damaged and, and you know, there needed to be some rebuilding going on. As, and I'm going around town, I'm meeting people, right? And everywhere I go, I'm meeting former New Life people. Oh, yeah, I used to go to New Life um, until that, you know, pastor had the problem. And I went, oh, you know, I said, man, if I had a nickel every time I'd heard that, I'd, I'd be rich. But So I was developing these hard feelings for this. I'd never met him. Uh, and then one Sunday, a few years ago, um, you could hear this audible buzz in the congregation, um, and and uh, it was he, it was the pa former pastor. He showed up with his wife, and um, of course, a lot of us didn't know who he was, uh, but but the, the old time new lifers that were still around knew who he was. And there's a buzz, and and he comes up to me after the service and introduces himself and says that he wants to uh, confess his sin and repent. And could he please meet with the elders? And so we called a special session meeting, and um, he came in and, um, with tears, confessed his sin and repented. And um, that began a process that culminated in ultimately a public restoration uh, 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 of this man. Uh, it's an amazing process. It's actually there's actually a procedure for it in the. Uh, PCA's Book of Church Order, uh, and it's it's a wonderful sort of ceremony where where he stands in front of the congregation in a very uh, clear way, conf you know, repents of his confesses and repents of his sin, and then in a very clear way is publicly restored to fellowship. And and man, there was not a dry eye in the house uh, that day, um, uh, but the. One of the things that happened, there happened to be a couple visiting that Sunday. Just happened to be, right? Um, they had been at New Life years ago under this senior pastor. And, and when, when, uh, when he had his uh, moral f fall, that event spun this couple right out of New Life uh, and r into a long season of deep doubt. Uh, it, which it had them spinning out of the church altogether. And they were just d 
deciding after years to make a tentative first step back to the church. And so they decided on this Sunday to come to new life. And there he is, right? The, the, this, their, their former senior pastor standing up there confessing his sin and then being embraced into the fellowship. And, and we, we talked to them afterwards, the, the, these people, and, and they had tears in their eyes. And, and, um, and, the, and, and they, they said that th this process convinced them that the gospel of Jesus Christ was real. S seeing grace and truth in action is what convinced them that the gospel was real. So... It, you know, look for ways to, to demonstrate it. I, one, I'll just say one last thing. I mean, as senior pastor, one of the ways you can stand for grace and truth is to be the stand-up guy, right? If, you, if you're in the pastorate for the long haul, you're going to have occasions where you're going to have to apologize. I have become a great apologizer as a pastor, right? I, have, I uh, you know, offend people, hurt people. Um, and be quick to apologize. And, and, if that's, uh, and sometimes that apology may require you to stand up and do it publicly, to, you know, depending on the, the nature of the offense. Uh, do it. Um, it is, uh, you know, by being the stand-up guy, and when there's responsibility to be taken, you're the senior pastor, take it. Stand up and take responsibility for... for, for uh, you know, for the faults of the church. Um, that, that kind of standing for grace and truth really helps a congregation stand in grace and truth. Okay? So that's it, living out grace and truth. Sixth, learning always. Learning always. Uh, maybe this one was easier for me because from the get-go at New Life, I knew that there were always people in the room who really knew more than I did. And I'm talking about the seminary professors. Uh, and there was always even a larger group in the room who believed they knew more than I did. And I'm talking about the seminary students. Um, seriously, though, if... Um, the, the, the reality is you're likely to, to pastor a church where you will be the expert in the room. I'm not, uh, but New Life is, is, is uh, you know, uniquely situated in that regard. You're likely to be a, the pastor of a church where you're the expert. Uh, you know, nobody else will know the biblical languages. Nobody else will have taken a systematics course. Um, uh, but what I want to emphasize here is that even if that's true for you, and it probably will be, just remember you still have a lot to learn. Uh, and many people in your church, if you're humble enough to accept it, can teach you a lot. Of course, over the years, I've learned a ton from, from the professors and, uh, and I have to admit, from the students as well. Uh, I have, uh, but I have also learned uh, from non-seminary trained ruling elders, non-seminary trained deacons, and non-seminary trained lay people. A lot. Um, if you've been in one of my preaching classes here, you know that one of the things I encourage you to try, if you can, in your churches, in your future churches, is a Q and a, having a Q&A session after your uh, worship service. I've, I, I've done one regularly at New Life for years. Um, one of the reasons I did a Q&A was, was because it provided a forum for the seminary professors to, uh, who attended New Life to speak up and enrich my understanding and enrich our people's understanding uh, of the sermon topic. But what I also discovered in the course of doing those uh, Q and A's is that I was I was astounded by the insights and the questions I would get from lay people, and they would they would see biblical connections that I had missed. Uh, they would ask questions that um, I couldn't answer, <laughs> um, uh, point out um, things that 
just really helpful. And that's why when we went to two services, uh, we, we had to figure out where, you know, where are we going to do Sunday school. We do Sunday school in the middle, so we, I do the Q&A in the middle. So, so uh, that, meant, that has meant that my, the sermon in the second service is always longer than the, than the sermon, and the wise people in the congregation know that. Yeah. If, you, if you don't want to hear Ted long, come to the first service. Because, because, why? Because I'm interacting with what I've just learned in the Q&A. And if I could have figured out how to do a Q&A on Thursday, I'd have been a much better preacher. Um, but uh, listen, we, uh, as, as, as pastors, we teach. That's, that's one of the things we do. But we are also necessarily learners, right? Simultaneously teachers and learners. Um, it's a two-way street. You teach your people, your, teacher, your people teach you. Um, some, of the, some of the most insightful teaching I've received, talking about congregational life, is, is talking with people who are dying. You know, sitting by the bedsides of, of, of my friends who, who are, uh, you know, just about to die. And to hear, to hear them and to hear how, how their faith uh, verbally expressed has been um, a source of great encouragement and wisdom to me and humility and a weird kind of envy. I've I never thought, you know, I'm sitting there watching and you know, holding the hand of a person dying and in some sense envying them. Because it's in, in that moment, you know, the Lord is pouring out his grace on them and they, they are knowing him at a level that I can only imagine. It's, boy, you can sure learn. You can sure learn from them. Um, uh, so don't despise the instruction of your people. It will deepen you, make you a better pastor. It will also make your congregation a more pleasant place to be because nobody likes to hang with a know-it-all. Know-it-all pastors are not fun. Um, seventh and finally, speaking plainly. Speaking plainly or simply. Uh, the smartest people I've known in business, the smartest people I've known in ministry are, were the ones who didn't sound smart. Now, it, that's not to say, I mind you, I'm not saying they sounded stupid. Uh, what, what I'm saying is that they didn't sound pretentiously smart. It was Albert Einstein who said, if you, if you can't explain it simply, uh, you don't understand it well enough. Um, you know, I th we need to speak plainly, that, not just in our preaching, but in, 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 our, in our teaching, in our, in our um, uh, you know, counseling, various interactions with our people, speaking plainly, you know, watching out for Christian shorthand and jargon. Uh, watching out for those technical theological terms. Um, not, and sometimes we need to use those technical theological terms. We, they're, they're, they're important. But we, if you're going to use them, make, make sure you define them. Uh, you know, make it clear what, what that word means, it, simply, clearly. And believe me, I'm not saying dumb down. I'm saying express complicated, deep, wonderful truth in a simple way so that people can grasp it, which proves that you've grasped it, right? I mean, that was my job as a, as a lawyer, was to take, that's why people pay, would pay lawyers big bucks, because we had to read this, all this complicated stuff, right, that people le read, glaze over, have no idea what it says, and then my job really was to do that and then turn around and tell a client, here's what it says and here's what you have to do. And say it in a way that they understand and that they're persuaded that, yes, that's okay, yes, that's what it is, and yes, I do have to do it, even if it means I have to pay more taxes. Um, so it's not, it's not dumbing down. It's quite the opposite. It's, it, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's a different and, and, and much more sophisticated task. And, and here are some advantages if you do this within your congregation. First, if you, do, if, you, if you speak simply, if you 
to t make the time and the effort to translate, you know, the deep things of the faith into easily understandable terms, uh, you're going to be original. You'll end up being original. Now, um, meaning you'll, you know, you'll, be, you'll, you'll, you'll have your voice. Uh, it's, it's too easy to default to, Christ, you know, to Christian jargon or too easy to default to how you've heard another pastor say it. Um, and I know, we're, we, you know we get concerned about plagiarism. Uh, think about your people, think who you're talking to, and then say it in a way that they will understand it. And you'll find yourself being original. Second, um, it takes you out of the picture, right? Um, the, the point is not to show your people how smart you are. It's, it's to show them how excellent Jesus is. And so if you, can, if you can communicate in a way that's not bringing attention to, man, he's smart. Man, he uses big words. But instead, you're, 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 you're simply and powerfully explaining to them the beauty of Jesus, then you're out of the picture, right? And, and, and they're focusing on Jesus. That's a good thing. Third, you're, you're creating a non-threatening environment for learning. Um, Right. If, if, if people come in and, and they're hearing all this uh, technical speak, pastor speak, um, they're, they're, they're going to feel like, and they may have to, run up a big learning curve just to begin to understand what you're saying. Right? So this, this encourages, it encourages learning. It's a better environment for learning. And fourth, it really it helps you do the work of an evangelist. And, and as pastors, look, we, we're, we're about shepherding God's people, but, but as Paul tells Timothy, we also need to do the work of an evangelist. And, and, by, and here I'm speaking mostly of preaching. If you can do it plainly and simply, um, a couple of things will happen. Your, your people will say, will, will hear you, and they'll, they'll begin to understand it better because they're now hearing it differently. Right? They're kind of getting a fresh take on, on, on an old truth. But they're, but they're also realizing that I've got a neighbor here who would understand this. I mean, he could, he could listen to this and understand it, not be offended by it, not be put off by it, not be mystified by it. He, would, he may not believe it, but at least he'd understand it. So, so you'll find that your people will start bringing unbelievers to come hear you uh, explain justification simply, right? Um, and uh, and sometimes they'll believe. It's uh, it's it's a beautiful thing. Men and women, boys and girls, can and should be convert converted by your preaching. Uh, as and 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 Christians as well should be built up in the faith, convicted of their sin, encouraged in their faith. But but you can, this Holy Spirit will use that kind of preaching to convert people. Okay, that's it for the seven, uh, seven guidelines. Uh, and those are, those are Ted's guidelines. Just because I used a biblical number <laughs> does not make them uh, canon, okay? Um, you, can, uh, you can take those for what they're worth. Um, two, two quick guardrails. Um, and now I'm going to... I'm going to give you a caution here because everything I've said so far is really, uh, you know, asking you to humbly pour yourself into the life of your people. Uh, but a, a temptation of a conscientious pastor, and I'm going to assume most of you will be that, uh, a conscientious pastor, is to overreact to the needs of your people. Um, if you do that, it's going to wear you out. It'll wear your family out. Uh, you won't be good for anybody if you are continually overreacting to, to the needs of your people and burning yourselves out. Not every legitimate need is a legitimate crisis. Um, there are real crises, uh, and you'll have to respond to those in real time, whether that's on a uh, middle of the night or on a Saturday when you're trying to get your sermon done for the next day. Uh, invariably, it seems, those, the real crises come up in times like that. But a lot of the needs of your people, um, perhaps most of them, 
that you'll be, be confronted with aren't do or die kinds of needs in the next few hours or or even the next few days. Uh, you can you could uh, uh, in, you could schedule them out right for for uh, you know schedule a meeting out for a day or two or even a week or two. Um, it, it's going to take some time and expertise to develop the discernment uh, here, but you need to do it um, because. Um, Otherwise, you'll be run ragged. And, and the real advantage is by doing that, it, it allows you some time to reflect and pray, uh, think about the topic, do some reading. Uh, so when you go into that meeting, you, you are, uh, you're better prepared. Uh, your meeting's more efficient. You're gonna, your wisdom will be better. I've made it a general rule now uh, to ask, it, when somebody asks me for a meeting, I always say, I'll agree to meet with you, but I have to have an advanced, a summary in advance of what the meeting's going to be about. Uh, I've stopped agreeing to blind meetings. I just, I don't like to be blindsided. Uh, I want to know what is going to be addressed so I can be praying and thinking about it. Um, and it, it's interesting. M most people have no problem doing that. The people that do have a problem doing that is they're wanting to meet you to, you know, um, tell you what a lousy pastor you are, All right? criticize you or what. Uh, they don't want to let you know in advance. They, they, they like the advantage of surprise. Um, but uh, anyway, so if they're reluctant, you probably know it's not going to be an easy meeting. Um, second caution. Listen to this quote it's by Arthur Gordon. Um, he says, one of the most insidious maladies of our time is the tendency in most of us to observe rather than act avoid rather than participate, not do rather than do, the tendency to give in to the sly, negative, cautionary voices that constantly counsel us to be careful, to be controlled, to be wary and prudent and hesitant and guarded in our approach of this complicated thing called living. That's an interesting insight. And I, if, if, if it's true about living in general, it, I believe it's also true about pastoring. And, and this is something this is something I'm experiencing right now, and it's something I'm struggling with right now. And uh, I think in part it's a reaction to the, the pandemic craziness and, and what we have faced as pastors. Uh, but, um, when, listen, you're going to be subject to criticism from time to time, sometimes harsh criticism. It just goes with leadership. Uh, but when you experience that, and especially if you experience it in an intense way like we have in the last couple of years, the tendency is to pull, the natural tendency is to pull in, right, to not engage, to be guarded, to avoid. And I, I'm seeing that in myself, and that's, that's, that concerns me. It's something I need to work against uh, as a pastor. It's something we all need to work against as pastor. We're called to spiritual warfare. We're called to suffer. For Christ's sake, we're called to love our enemies, right? Jesus didn't tell us it would be easy. Uh, we don't have the luxury as pastors to hang back and be guarded. But the good news, and I'll close with this, uh, as I circle back to the defining text for this series, number 16 on Korah's rebellion, uh, if you remember that Moses asks Korah, right, is it too small a thing? Is it too small a thing? for you that, that, that the Lord has separated you from the congregation of Israel to do service in the tabernacle? Right? He was, remember, Korah wasn't happy about that. Um, but, but it's important to see that Moses asks something else, and I didn't focus on it on Tuesday, but I'm here. He says, it, he asks another thing. He says, it's too small a thing that in calling you to stand before the congregation and do service in the tabernacle, is it too small a thing that God has brought you near to himself? Is it too small a thing that God has brought you near to himself? Christian brothers and sisters, remember that. In calling you to the work of the local church and calling you to stand up in front of your congregation, God is also simultaneously bringing you to himself. What a stunning truth and what a stunning privilege. And what it emphasizes is that you're not doing this task alone, ever, right? 
as you call. It, sometimes it seems oh, oh, like you're alone up here. Uh, but no, God is, is, is br- bringing you to himself. The Lord, our Lord, the Lord Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. And, and it's that withness of God uh, that ultimately enables us to persevere in the work of shepherding. Amen. Thank you very much, guys. It's been a pleasure. Let me close. Let me let me let me close with prayer. Lord, thank you. Um, thank you for my brothers and sisters here. Thank you for the professors and this institution. Uh, I pray for the education um, that's happening here, Lord. Uh, that and as it happens, that these students will be prepared uh, and enthusiastic for service in your church. May we live and act and preach for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.